All right, we are live with Dr. Dylan today. We are talking about um, creating these exceptional learning spaces and the whole concept of what is changing within our spaces in our classroom. And I have a few questions for Dr. Dylan, but we were really just wanting this to be authentic and a chance for people to really just see the background of creating these learning spaces and having an idea of how this works where it started, where he's been going for the past several years, and the book that co-author uh, that he was a co-author with, and just creating some really cool spaces. So, Dr. Dylan, if you want to introduce yourself, give yourself a little bit of a background, and and also share your friend that you brought with you. Sure, <laughs> thanks, Jamie. And it's uh, always good to work with Atomic Learning. You guys have been fantastic, and uh, both love your product and love the work that we've been doing together. So. Uh, it's been a good partnership. So it is nice after the last time uh, I was with you all, I, those videos came live from beautiful uh, Twin Falls, Minnesota. So it's nice to be back here in, um, in St. Louis and kind of back to where all this started. So about 18 months ago, um, I had one of those serendipitous collisions with um, a pretty incredible person who became my co-author around Learning Spaces. And um, you know, part of that is just the whole piece of being able to figure out um, you know, what, what happens when you cross paths between design and education? And um, we've been uh, designing learning spaces and talking about learning spaces ever since. And so today we come live from uh, room 15. You can see it over my shoulder. Uh, it was the original um, uh, place here at Afton High School where we decided that we were going to take an old computer lab and turn it into something that kids could use to create and make and design. And so um, my, the one-to-one -one coordinator here at Afton High School, uh, Manuel Herrera, has joined us. So we can uh, all have a conversation uh, about learning spaces in general, about what's happening here, about what we're seeing around the country. So I'm going to bring him in. All right. There we go. <laughs> hey. uh, yeah, yeah. I, know, yeah, I was just going to kind of reintroduce myself, Manuel Herrera. I'm the one-to-one -one coordinator here at Afton High School. Um, and um, kind of my role is to support technology in the classroom and support kids in the classroom and then also get to kind of facilitate facilitate the design space that's that we've kind of created. Yeah, so one of the things, Jamie, I think we're noticing is that um, th there's a really big interest. I mean, uh, when Learning Spaces was uh, mentioned in the Horizon Report as a long-term trend for schools, I was actually really surprised, uh, but as I travel around the country talking about this, we're starting to see, you know, not just the schools that have big budgets and lots of uh, bond money, but folks that are trying to figure out how to do this um, for a whole bunch of reasons. One, uh, they think it brings joy to classrooms, uh, it brings energy to classrooms. Uh, it starts to change the conversation about classrooms. So all three of those reasons um, are popping up everywhere around learning spaces. It's been uh, I don't know, it's refreshing to see because um, the last thing I want is my two daughters, uh, when they end up in a high school, to be sitting in a bunch of desks and a bunch of rows. I can only hope that that's not the case. Yeah, well, I guess one of the first questions here is looking at that change. What do you see learning changes happening and changing the way students are learning? Yeah, I'll start and then I'll let Manuel tell an example of maybe something he's seen. Um, you know, we call for collaboration all the time, right? You know, kids have to be collaborative. They have to work together. We're always working with different people. We're in different states. We're in different countries. And then we set up situations where kids look at the back of each other's heads in rows, right? And so um, we give a lot of lip service to changing the way schooling is done. But we try to do it in a very traditional space oftentimes. So what we're seeing is that sometimes schools are saying, you know what, if we start to change the learning space, it will change the conversation about student-led learning. And so that, that's what we're seeing more than anything else, are folks saying, enough, I can't be the person, I can't be the one expert in front of the room. Uh, we've got to do something different. And um, folks are leaping in and we're getting a lot of uh, traction from folks that are reading the book, The Space, saying how it is uh, just changing the conversations in their schools and how much their students appreciate uh, the fact they've made the change. Any thoughts? Yeah, you know, one of the things when we started kind of creating the space, um, you know, kids were kind of peeking in and seeing the space kind of evolve and change. And as we started to add elements and as we invited kids to come in and kind of take a look and, and oh. 
Thank you. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, you know, kids were peeking in and coming in and seeing and seeing the space and kind of how it evolved and how it started to look different than their kind of traditional classroom. Um, we had kids come in and they would they came and they sat and like, what is this? I I want to be here. I'm like, I want to take this <laughs> class. I'm like, what? I don't even. It's not a class. Like, what? Well, I don't care. I want to take it. And we're like, well, you know, why? Why do you want to be in here? What? What about it draws you in? And like, I don't know. It just feels different. It just feels totally different. And it, I think it was, you know, seating in the room just to begin with was just non-traditional. It was just tables, which, you know, a lot of teachers do have, and we've kind of moved to that. But um, it, 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 something about the room and something about the way we have things set up, and it's just a different energy. Uh, we allow kids to write on the tables, and that was one of the things the kids immediately started to do when they came in was write on the tables. And little things like that, um, you know, kind of got them excited again about kind of what was to come or, you know, the learning process that was going to happen. So. Yeah. And, and I think, Jamie, one of the things I end up talking about is that, you know, a level one collaboration is great. Maybe you have some kids working on a Google Doc and they're working together. But what about that level two collaboration where, you know, the first hour class and the third hour class and the fifth hour class are helping each other out by leaving stuff up on writable surfaces? You know, maybe there are, you know, shower board or T walls or portable whiteboards where kids are putting notes up for first hour so the third hour already knows and they're ahead of the game. And then also creating a space like this where kids can collaborate with folks in other schools and other states and other countries. And so uh, you need to have a space that, you know, the audio and visual works and you can bring experts in and thumb up on the big screen and, um, the space has started to do all that and now it's starting to trickle out back into classrooms and so we certainly don't want this to be the one location where stuff happens we want to build a culture of this being what's the norm what do you think your favorite parts of these innovative spaces are uh thoughts for me and it's just my experience with come with having kids come in here um is there they're, they're able to write on everything. I know I said it earlier, but something about that, it, kids love and they still love it. So anything that they can write on, it, just having the opportunity to express an idea, even if it's just a quick piece of artwork, um, kind of like Dr. Dylan said, I constantly have kids leave stuff, old work, and kids will come in and still read it. it you know, they're not prompted, there's nothing up there that looks appealing, but because it's there, they'll read it. Um, that is probably my favorite element, and it seems to be the kid's favorite element. Um, we, we really work with them on, on Brainstorming, kids still, you know, we we moved to a very digital classroom, um, at, at least here when we first went one-to-one, -one, and, you know, we promoted how great Google Docs is for collaboration and how great Google Docs is to capture ideas and it can be accessed anywhere. Um, but I think we've done enough, or not enough, but we've done a lot of that, and now now we're kind of going back kind of the pendulum swing the other way where we need to get kids talking in front of each other, and really brainstorming is just kind of this rapid fire of ideas uh, they can't always happen in a Google Doc, and so for kids to pick up a marker and exactly where they are, where they stand, where they sit, where they – some lie down. Uh, you know, they, they're able to just write those ideas and get them out and get them flowing. Um, it, it's just a beautiful thing, and I, I wish I had the picture to show you of a, of a girl planning out a, a video that she was supposed to shoot for, um, for a social studies class. We, we talked about planning videos out, and she – you know, we kind of talked about the board, how the board, you know, can be used, and it was this – explosion of ideas that I don't think would have happened otherwise. I don't think that would have happened on the Google Doc. I don't think that necessarily would have happened in a PowerPoint presentation. Um, but to see that, that, that is one thing that I've seen um, a lot of and probably on a daily basis when kids come in here. That's the first thing. It's not really the seating necessarily. It's not always, um, you know, some of the, the tools that we have in here. It's really just the idea that I can put my ideas out there on a surface, leave them there for others to see. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, that was kind of long. But. Yeah, you know, and the, the other thing is, um, you know, it's it's the kid that is just tired of school that you see like, oh, I can sit where I want. I have a little more control of my life. I get to choose how I show people that I know how to do my work. Oh, that's going to be awesome. Like, I don't know. There's just that whole group of kids that struggle that um, you see spaces like this kind of bring some life back to. Um, that's my favorite part is just that energy. Uh, there's just a different energy when you make a few changes. And uh, I tell people all the time, this is a free process to some level, right? Like you can do so much addition by subtraction in a learning space. Hmm. And everything you take out, that's free, right? Like I, I tell teachers, 
you know, find three or four things in your room that just don't do anything to add to learning and take them out. And that can be a really powerful way for folks to just liberate a space because actually just creating more square footage makes it easier for people to move around, makes it easier for you to be more flexible, uh, moving things around. And so, um, you know, those sort of things go a long way. You know, not everybody gets to paint their walls and not everybody gets to put up acoustic tiles and not everyone gets to put in fancy lights in their room, but everybody can take things out that are distracting. Uh, you know, so many elementary teachers have said, well, I have all these students and they are so distracted these days. And I said, well, it's your room that's distracting them. It's not the kids. And sometimes we don't think that way. Uh, that doesn't have to be decorated, right? Um, and so you look around in this room, um, there's not like big decorations around, but it's still an inspiring space. That's really interesting. I know Montessori schools, you know, they only have at the student level, like the things that they have. And so as an, as an adult, you walk in and you're like, well, where is everything? And you can't, you know, everything looks blank to us, but they really bring it to the student level where they are and really, you know, understanding visually how important that is. So, you know, what was your role in this journey of where you started to where you're at now? Yeah, I, you know, I think part of it, the first thing was just empowering people to say, let's go for it. Let's try something different. And certainly I was the cheerleader at the beginning, but other people started to pick up on this as well. Um, you know, librarians all over the district here in Afton are trying things. Uh, teachers are trying things. Um, but it was really just that. Uh, too often in education, leaders forget they have to give people permission, right? Oftentimes teachers were the good kids, right? They followed the rules. And if they don't know that they have permission to do something, they don't do it. Uh, and so I, the first part of the journey truly is unleashing people and giving people permission to try things. Um, and we did that. And, you know, the best part, a lot, some of it failed. And I talk about this room had grand plans to be this and this and this, and it didn't become that. Uh, and then the second piece was uh, doing some listening to students and to hearing what they want. Uh, a lot of times adults solve problems that kids don't even have. Uh, and we think, oh, we need to do this for the kids, and no one asked the kids. And so remembering that we're designing it uh, hopefully with kids and not uh, for them is an important piece of that puzzle as well. Any thoughts? No, that's you know, that's exactly what we had to do. We went through a couple of iterations, and I think the first couple of iterations were us trying to solve problems for kids that didn't exist. You know, my first thought, oh, the big trend is maker spaces. That that's exactly what we need. We need three D printers, and we need these um, these other tools that because that's what everybody else is doing. And that wasn't really a problem, or it wasn't going to solve anything for anyone. Uh, at least in our school, we learned that, and um, you know, attracted a few kids, but. It was really waiting to, be, to, to listen to see what kids needed and what they were wanting um, in their school and kind of understanding the problems, even talking with teachers, like what else do kids need? What kind of support can we provide them? Did this place space become what it is? And even today, it's still constantly evolving. It's still constantly changing. You know, I don't want it to look the same. And, and I think Dr. Dillon mentioned this earlier. We also want the elements that are here to be out in the classroom. I don't want this to be you know, the next computer lab. All right, we're going to do the kind of the fun stuff or innovative thinking or, um, you know, we're going to go down to room 15. But this needs to be out in the classrooms. And, and it's, so, it's slowly starting to trickle trickle out. So, yeah. What were some surprises that you experienced in, in this process? So I hear that you guys thought this is the problem students have, but this isn't the problem that they have. So I would have thought 3D printers would have been, you know, the given just because that's such a trend right now. You're right, in makerspaces. So, if that's the case, what did you find that the students were asking for and needed that you did not anticipate? Yeah, um, it's funny. sometimes the kids don't know what they don't know. And so we have to, we do have to have some like neat to have things in these kind of spaces, right? That we don't even know how they're gonna be used or what they're gonna be used for, but I think you do have to spend a little money with those kind of items. Um, you know, I, I see folks buy drones, right? Oh, we got this cool drone. I'm like, you know, the first question a lot of people, what are you going to use that for? And I'm like, who cares? It, it's going to draw attention. It's going to get some people thinking. It's going to breed some creativity. So one of my surprises was that stuff doesn't have to have function, right? I mean, you can't spend thousands upon thousands upon thousands, but 
it's okay to have some things in the room that you just don't know what they're going to do uh, and let them naturally take that form. And so that's been exciting for me to watch is that things and elements that I wasn't even expecting to blossom do. Uh, and we see this happen all the time where um, I was like, oh, I accidentally left that in your room. And they're like, oh, no, that turned out to be the key element for this whole thing. Um, and then the other thing, I thought we were going to have to spend more money than we were going to, than we did. Uh, so much of this is done for $500, $800. Um, you know, we've done big projects for, you know, $2,500, uh, you know, a whole library transformation where, you, you know, you buy a few couches, you move some things around, you put up some writable space, and you let the kids interact with it. And then um, you kind of figure out what's going on from there. But those are my two biggest surprises, I think. Uh, I, I had a couple. I have a few. Um, kind of going back to the 3D printer, um, they're, they're great. I love them. And, and I present and talk about how wonderful they are. Um, but now I, I kind of start my presentation with is, is, is to almost talk you out of a 3D printer. Uh, because I learned that kids love to 3D print. Not all students love to design three-dimensional mm -hmm. objects. Uh, and that takes, that's, you know, that's really where the learning happens. And so I was really surprised, like, you know, we put that 3D printer, we bought it, we purchased 3D printer, we had, you know, some ideas and we had some plans and we put those in place. Um, and, and things were great, but I only had five, six, seven, eight kids who were interested in it out of a school of 800. Um, so, you know, I knew we, need, we needed some, do, to look at things differently as far as makerspace goes. Um, how inexpensive it was to do a lot of the things that we've done in here. Um, you know, we have people come in all the time to, to tour the school and, and kind of ask about our one-to-one -one uh, program. And when we bring them in here, we ask, well, how much money did you spend? And when, and when we go back and look at everything that's in here, you know, it's the same existing tables that were in here. It's the art stools that we borrowed from the art department. <laughs> you know, it, it's the, the tables we took from the cafeteria that were the high-top tables because kids were coming in and eating. Um, it, it was really done very inexpensive and it, it, you don't have to spend a lot of money to create an inspiring space um, and I guess the last big surprise was that after we, we kind of tweaked the space and it's gone through a few iterations you know I looked back and said we, ne we never once said we're doing this because we're a one-to-one -one school or we're doing this mm -hmm. because we have technology you know we didn't count the outlets in the walls we didn't make sure there was plenty of power in here we didn't make sure we had to have a projector because kids are it had nothing to do with that. It, it, it was all about an experience, in, it, creating an experience for kids as they learn. And, you know, this can happen in any school. A school does not have to be one-to-one -one or high-tech or, or any of that in order to create inspiring spaces. And, and technology is just a tool. Um, that was really surprising in that I, I just reflected back and said, wow, I'm, we're one-to-one, -one, but we never made that the centerpiece of, of this room. So, um, yeah, those are, those are probably my three biggest surprises. And I think it's even interesting to not just be consumed with in order to have a 3D printer, you have to, the, the process of learning, right? So they've created and now they're here and now they're printing and this whole process that we obviously, what we all look at is 3D printing. But I think when I shared this with younger students, just the concept that something can be created, you know, just sparking that enthusiasm that like, I'm not limited anymore. I can have this. Or what it, how does it go from here? Like, how do you start from here and it becomes something? So we talked about what it printed on and, and how it stayed and what did it take to solidify. And so all of those concepts and that learning process, even if they're not the ones creating, just the process of what a 3D printer has brought to the table, I think is just so unique to bring that to the classroom. So there, there could be kids that want to break it apart and redesign it and recreate it. That might be their interest, you know? So it's pretty neat to see that it's not limited. I totally agree with you. I think everybody needs to be at a place to buy a 3D printer doesn't solve your problems for sure. Um, but I also, you know, it's like in, the, in light of that, it's a, good, it's a good process for them to grasp and to give them the freedom of wherever they're at, their interest and what they're gonna pursue. That's, that's pretty neat. Dr. Dillon, I, I know that you want to say something, and after you're done, I'm going to ask you if you can share your space, because I'm, I'm totally overwhelmed with all the white. I'm like, I, this is not what I expected at all, but this is fantastic, because yeah. I think that's blown my mind, and that's, I'm so excited to see it. Yeah, we'll do that, and I, yeah, I think the only thing I wanted to add was that, you know, the engaged mind will absorb whatever standards you want, right? And if you're talking about 3D printing and being able to talk about the science of that or the art of that, 
just get kids engaged somehow goes a long way. My favorite part about 3D printers everywhere is the big pile of failures <laughs> that is on every, like everybody's like, yep, this printed for nine hours and now it's all just a big pile of muck. Um, that's the biggest learning that I get from 3D printers are the pr 3D printing failures. So that's my, that's my piece of the puzzle. So. Oh, I had some great epic fails with 3D pens. Oh. Yeah, I still haven't figured out how those work. Right? <laughs> you are really talented. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let me see. This is going to be a messy tour, but let's see how we can do this here with the okay. computer. Um, okay. And so, um, you know, one of the things you'll see behind is that um, are these um, T walls, and you flip these things around here, right? And they have. Let me see. That. So that you have multiple writable spaces on these, and so. They are literally a four by eight T, and so I am too close to those. So, um, but they give you a sense of being able to have a big, writable, portable space, and you can hide kids behind the back of them to give them some space. You can have multiple groups working over there. Um, then we have this big, huge, sixteen foot um, writable wall that's all uh, shower boards. So that whole thing cost us about two hundred dollars, uh, which is awesome. And then we have a couple of different seating elements. Uh, one of the things I try to focus on is, can we um, have at least three or four different type of seating elements in every uh, classroom or every space? And you know, you can see the writable table in the middle. And you know, there's just a difference when students are sitting in these types of chairs, relaxed, kicked back. Um, the kind of conversations that happen are different than when you put kids in on stools. And so very different than the space over there in the corner there where you see it's kind of a sit on the floor, beanbag, whiteboard space. And uh, you got to love the change your perspective upside. I love it. Right? So awesome. And then, um, you know, further around in the room, you know, you go way over there and there's a laser etcher and a big like collaborative tech space. Um, and, you know, that's new to this space this year. And so uh, students come, come in and plug their devices in and collaborate together. Um, so you have all of that, um, all in this room, uh, and then you end up, what ends up happening is you see adults are coming in here to plan, right? Because there's a different energy. And then, you know, um, kids are vying for spaces and realizing they can work in the same space as adults, which is pretty cool. Um, and then, you know, like Manuel said, this big whiteboard is never this clean, right? It's always got ideas on it. Yeah, he raced it just for the day. So <laughs> I'm and then, so bummed. <laughs> and then you get all the way to here at the end, and there's the 3D printer, right? Uh, sitting right there doing its thing. And, you know, you can project, and we've got a whiteboard in there. And, um, yeah, so that's the space. Um, and it's just been really, really, um, it's just been really healthy and really productive for everyone. What was the first thing you eliminated in that space? Oh. All 35 computers oh, that yeah. were in the computer lab. <laughs> One of, the, one of the things that's great about the, you know it, it being a flexible space and it's starting to get a lot of um, kind of traffic this year is that all the furniture is it, you can move it. It's really easy to move. The large tables now have wheels. The furniture that doesn't have wheels is very light. And what we do, and this is going to be cool because we're going to do a lot of that this year coming up, is that we can set this space up in kind of a presentation mode. And what we do is because there's, there's varied height seating, we set it up almost stadium, stadium style seating for presentation. And we actually project onto this wall. So now a student's projection is, you know, eight feet tall by eight feet wide. It's huge. And so they're standing actually next to the presentation. And it, it's a really cool, I sent a link to Dr. Dillon just now. That's a, um, it's a Google, it's a folder full of photos. So I don't know if he wants to share that with you at some point um, or if we can share that now. But you, you can see how we set the room up. And uh, pillows are on the floor on the first layer. These black chairs are the next layer, the bar stools. And then we used to have the bar top tables. And so everyone can see you can fit about 40 people. Again, you know, I, I just have a larger room. But it's really nice to now set it up as a presentation. A student feels like they are presenting. They're not behind a computer lab desk um, or, you know, crammed in a small space trying to present to kids. It, it really, again, it's that different. I'm in a different area. I'm in a different place. <laughs> And I'm here to present um, something very formal in, in some cases. And uh, one of our English teachers is doing um, TED Talks, and she's going to have kids present uh, at the end of the semester. And they're going to come in here, and we're going to give them the rug, the carpet, the whole That's deal. Awesome. I'm trying to figure out how to come up with a large AHS, you know, <laughs> TED style. 
um, you know, signage for You'll them. figure that out. No, I'll figure it out. <laughs> um, that, that, that also adds some excitement to it. It's not just another presentation for a class. It's I'm going to be presenting to someone um, yeah. some information. So that's really cool. And it's fun to see. I mean, I get a chance to see a bunch of these spaces around the country, and um, they all look different. Uh, but they're all purpose driven, which is kind of cool, right? Like people are saying purpose first and second, like, what do we want to do with this? Um, and you know, social studies rooms and math classrooms shouldn't look the same. They have different purposes. Um, yeah. And we're at a school. You can tell now bell ring and everybody's coming down the hallway. So we got that going on. <laughs> Okay, and I just want to say that um, I'm going to be a part of this with you guys because I want to make my learning space too. And um, you know, that's what I feel like you guys have to do. Right? <laughs> what? So, that works out good. Um, but you know, for women, you know, it's hard to grasp all white. I think that's just such a mind change. So, do you think being guys has an influence on this learning space, or do you think a woman's learning space would look different? Well, the funny part is this isn't this doesn't look like every learning space we've put together, right? I mean, we have uh, you know on on December fifteenth we have this big event coming up where uh, you know one of the rooms is you know totally different. It has this whole different palette of colors, and that's I think what we ask is that teachers be thoughtful about the palette of the room. If they have an opportunity to make change in color, that they're thoughtful about the colors they're choosing and don't choose all of them. Uh, choose a few of those colors, but uh, yeah, this room worked like this, um, and not all of them look like no, this for sure. No, especially so, in the elementary setting. Yeah. Well, I know we're starting so. to run out of time, and the biggest questions I have are really: where do teachers start? What types of things should they be prepared for here in the future? Because um, you know, changing up your room is a big deal. I think eliminating a lot of stuff takes a lot of time. So, thinking even right now, we're in November. What would you recommend, say somebody's watching and they're, they're really excited, they're ready to make a change, what would be the first plan of action? Yeah, you know, um, start having conversations with kids about what's serving them and what's failing them. I mean, start there. Uh, there is no expense to having those conversations. And sometimes we aren't even aware of the things that kids see as issues. Uh, the second thing is go explore what's out there. Uh, around learning spaces and sometimes that's the public library sometimes that is uh, somebody's house in town sometimes that's just pictures online but go see what's possible and you may not go all the way to there but unless you kind of broaden out your palette of what's possible I, I think it's hard to begin to see what changes you could make um, and then stop talking about it and do something um, do something it doesn't mean you have to do the whole project but Take out a desk, take out a table, move your teacher desk, take out a bookshelf, close the blinds, bring in a lamp, do something, and then get some feedback again from the kids about the change you made. Uh, I mean, I, I would say the exact same thing. Going out, getting out of your space, looking at other inspirational spaces, and like Dr. Dillon said, and that might be the coffee shop, that might be the library, but look at other spaces. Not that you're trying to recreate that, but be inspired by that. What is what is the emotion that you get from this space and what's causing that? What's causing that emotion? Um, and, and I think you can, that, that, that'll take you a long way. Um, and, and then like I said, do something, take stuff out of your room, work with the kids. Um, the kids really, I, I just read a really good article on um, creating safe spaces for students in the classroom. And uh, sometimes you need, you need to have, you know, one-to-one -one conversations with kids about that, and that sometimes kids need that. And how do you, how do you create that type of space for, for those kind of students um, who need it. Yeah, you know, we see all the research on how stressed out kids are. Um, this is one of, you know, the silver buckshot around stress in kids, right? Can we put them in places where they're comfortable, where they feel like they have some control? Um, it's a big deal. I mean, I put this right up next to schedules and grading as big things that we have to change in order to really make this jump forward in education. So um, those are the, I do see that as uh, the trend pieces. Um, again, it's not about the stuff, it's about the experience you can create for kids. Uh, and then just the other thing I'm seeing is that um, let, teachers are starting to say like, that space isn't mine. You're starting to see like, 
all of the learning spaces in this building I use when the time's appropriate. And so kind of that single classroom ownership thing is I think a far term trend um, where people are going to be in different spaces because they have a need as opposed to I was assigned to that room, um, which is usually the reality in most schools. Right. I know floating, you know, you have your cart of floating items and going from space to space, which can be challenging when you're talking about manipulatives and some of the things that you have floating around. But I, I think you're right. If, if all the manipulatives are in one location and that's what you're going to be working on, then why keep everything in one space as yeah. opposed to having a lot of that stuff in each individual space? That really does make a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, imagine if, you know, a group of elementary teachers said, why don't you set your room up so it's perfect for math instruction? And why don't you set your room up so it's perfect for reading? And think about how that would look differently. Maybe the math room has more writable spaces so kids are up and doing math problems all around the room. And then maybe there's a reading teacher where, you know, there's more comfortable spaces so independent reading's not happening in desks. And folks just move into those spaces to learn because they're the right spaces as opposed to trying to make one room fit the needs for everything. Yeah, I remember a teacher, I mean, he was limited to what he was assigned to a place. He was limited in board space. He was a math teacher, like you said, get kids getting up, but he was very passionate about his students getting up and writing. And his particular room had windows that looked out to the hallway, uh, odd, but they had windows all around it. So he just put a piece of paper on the other side gave everybody expo markers and the kids were up everywhere around the room just writing on those windows and it was so perfect I mean it was exactly what those kids they needed something like that they needed to have something different like you said writing on tables or writing everywhere you know just having their thoughts just flow everywhere that is such a liberating experience for our students when we have been so constrained to this desk for so long so um, these learning spaces are super inspiring, and I know that there are some great resources out there. Um, one is you have you are a contributor with Atomic Learning, so you have created a module. Um, maybe you could share just for a second about what that module contains. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, Rebecca Hare and I, I'm the co-author for our book, The Space, um, really wanted to kind of break down um, some of these elements we've been talking about. So we built out a, a 10 video. Um, series and they're about three or four minutes long uh, so you know uh, we weren't looking to build the uh, 9 12 30 minute video but a bunch of small chunks that you know uh, folks could watch and really have something meaningful that they could do the next day or the next week in their learning space uh, whether it was a different conversation to have or a different way to think about their room or really some actions to take and so we built out a really I think usable practical series um, for folks to do. And so if you, for more information on that, I'm sure the Atomic Learning folks can get you to the right spot on that. Absolutely, and as soon as we're done, I'm going to send out a tweet that includes your blog talking a lot more in depth about the learning spaces and what really to um, learn a, lo a lot more about what this means. The, if you have Atomic Learning, they're able to go in and experience that module as well and um, also here, so just having a reference back. But I really appreciate both you and Manuel coming up and sharing your space and your time and your energy, and I, I definitely hear the passion and what you were doing. So I am super thankful for this time with you, and um, yeah, I'm excited. Whoever, can, whoever wants to watch or connect with you in the future, you are who on a, at uh, Twitter? Uh, you can reach me. I am at IdeaGuy42 on Twitter. And uh, I'm Manuel Herrera33 uh, on Twitter and Instagram. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. Thanks for thank being you. with us. All right.